our analysis of Congress is that there are some 500 people there. Most, uh, at least 300 of them are uh, akin to airport wind socks. And that is when you talk to them about a public policy issue, they have their hand up to see which way the wind is blowing, uh, regardless of whether or not they're uh, charmed by your arguments. Well, that means that uh, that leaves several hundred, maybe, who have some sort of uh, philosophy. Uh, I don't know whether maybe it's a hundred uh, real bad ones and a hundred that are better, but uh, there are very few uh, for whom I personally have a great deal of respect. Now, there are some of them who uh, I have more respect for, but uh, there are some good people there for sure uh, who are both good people and who both agree with me on many things. So uh, <laughs> I have a great deal of respect. But I should say that there is no member of Congress for whom I have greater respect than our final speaker this afternoon, Congressman Ron Paul. He is a representative from Texas, the 22nd District. He is a physician, got his uh, medical degree from Duke University, is a graduate of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. He has been very active in the issue of gold, and he serves now as a member of the Gold Commission, and he wrote a book called Gold, Peace, and Prosperity. An example of Dr. Paul's voting record uh, can be attested to by the fact that in the first two years that the council has had a survey of Congress on some 60 bills, Congressman Paul has uh, been uh, far and away the outstanding member of Congress in our voting study. He's also received the top rating from the National Federation of Independent Businesses watchdog on the, of the Treasury, and he's also been named the taxpayer's best friend by the National Taxpayers Union. He heads a foundation, nonprofit foundation called the Foundation for Rational Economics and Education, which publishes a paper called the Freedom Report. We started out with Leonard Leggio talking about ideas have consequences, but ideas don't exist simply in the ether. They have to get somewhere into the public policy realm. And we've asked Dr. Paul to talk this afternoon to us as a close to our convention about the politics of these radical ideas. Dr. Paul. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Delighted to be with you this afternoon. I feel like there's not going to be a whole lot I can offer to a sophisticated audience like this who have heard all the experts and explained to you the best way to solve our problems. But I do have a special uh, perspective on this uh, problem that we face by being a member of Congress and one who uh, certainly joins the council in their desire for a competitive free economy. Um, it was mentioned by Richard, the, uh, the awards that I've won, uh, like voting most uh, often for competition, for the least amount of taxes and the least amount of spending. Uh, there was, it was not too long ago in the last election that we had a corporation that we were soliciting support from and hoping at least to neutralize them so they, the money didn't go to the opposition. And uh, we sent word to them we were seeking their support and the uh, spokesman came back and said, well, yes, we sort of like what he's doing, but he's not pro-business. And uh, of course, we found out a little bit more about what pro-business means, and I'm sure you can guess uh, <laughs> Pro-business doesn't necessarily mean an opportunity to compete and to earn a profit, uh, produce a product and a service, and uh, withstand the tests of the uh, free market. Pro-business pro means that uh, you should help them a little bit. And in this particular case, they had come to me and asked me uh, for an assistance in getting a, uh, a grant, a, a contract, and... Uh, uh, we weren't too receptive to it, and uh, this made them unhappy, and therefore they were going to uh, challenge me and have uh, persistently, and they certainly passed the word around that I'm not pro-business. Now, I think most of you can understand that rather clearly, what pro-business means, and, and the problems we face in Washington as politicians who will advocate a, a free market position. Some days it's very discouraging, you think, well, you'll never get anywhere. Uh, because the system is built in to uh, benefiting uh, only the special interests and the politicians know the system. All we have are bureaucrats and programs up here to deal with, and there's not much chance that we can get our views and our ideas across. 
I think there's every uh, bit of a reason to, uh, to be optimistic, uh, uh, even though we have, have those down moments. Uh, uh, there has been a tremendous change. I first went to Congress uh, in 76. I lost after that, but it was an early start for me in 76. And I would say, say compared to 76 till now, uh, there's a quite a bit of difference about what's happening. Not necessarily in the in legislation, but what's happening in the country and among groups like this, and, and that's where the difference is. I was fortunate enough not too long ago to to be invited to a group in in Milwaukee, a free market group that I was very impressed by. Uh, j just the other night, I was invited uh, up to Newark, New Jersey, and uh, this was I. They said when the information came to me from the staff, they said this uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce group wants you to talk up in Newark. And I stopped and I said, Newark wants a chamber of commerce, wants me to talk? I said, do they know, you know who I am? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, they know. They know. They want to talk about free enterprise, and they believe in it. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the conversation went back and forth. And they said, yes, they, they really believe in free enterprise, and there's some good guys up there. And they know exactly your voting record, and uh, they want you to come up and, and uh, defend it. And I said, well, um, I need some more credentials, and uh, and finally I I got some more information. Seems like Richard might have even recommended them. I can't recall who all said, but they said yes, it's a good group. They know what they're doing, know what they're talking about. And uh, I thought, well, the real test will be this. I said, well, if they're really really serious, and they did ask about talking about the gold standard also. I said, see if uh, they offered an honorarium. I said, see if they'll agree to the contract and pay me in gold. And uh, <laughs> Sure enough, they came back and they said they'd pay me in gold, so I thought, well, I guess for the first time I'll come north of the Mason-Dixon and east of the Mississippi and I'll venture in. And, uh, but, but it was a delight. I mean, it was a good group. It had a foundation associated uh, with the group. And uh, I think it's very encouraging to know that this exists outside of Texas, you know. I thought only Texas had the good guys. <laughs> so, but, but ideas are changing. Uh, the rhetoric's getting a little bit better in Washington. I still think we have a long way to go in Washington to correct the, the, uh, the ills. Uh, I am a firm believer in the saying that uh, ideas do have consequences. But I take this into consideration in light of the fact that uh, politics sometimes move and meander about for uh, non-essential reasons. Uh, it isn't uh, so direct, I think, that most people still do vote for very, very superficial reasons. Uh, and uh, this can almost be used to our benefit as well, because in spite of my voting record, which is uh, rather uh, definitely defined as far as not voting for subsidies, even for my own district, which becomes difficult to defend in a political campaign. For instance, we have uh, three major projects in our district that would be considered federally necessary to, uh, to exist. Uh, and we need the federal government. That is. Uh, the port authority, which needed more money, uh, the, the flooding areas that needed federal flood insurance, and also the NASA uh, project, which is rather large for Houston. And uh, sometimes you can get away with a bad vote if they don't know about it. Uh, <laughs> but those three issues were used day in and day out against me in the campaign and said, Ron Paul doesn't even care about his own district. He votes against us all the time. And uh, it's, it's a principally a Democratic district, so it isn't a partisan thing that was going on. I'm not in an 80% Republican district, so I wasn't guaranteed uh, an election regardless. It's a principally a Democratic district. So the conception or the perception of most everybody on the House floor when they're voting is that, yes, they got to see the, which way the wind sock's blowing in order to survive as a politician. I think they're mis construing things. I think the American people are much more sophisticated and much more willing uh, to, to look at, uh, at issues in, uh, in, in some sort of way. Because in, in spite of that, uh, I was still able, able to you know, a, achieve a, uh, a political victory, that is, uh, not lose on, on the fact that I did not become the champion of the handout that people are willing to. But in the same sense, did all those people out there, those uh, 50 plus 0.01 percent who elected me, did they really understand my philosophy, the free market? Did they understand all the ideas? You know, I don't think so. 
I think that uh, the ideas were important. Uh, I think the ideas of interventionism has been important to move the country in a bad direction for a long time, and that the ideas that I hold and the ideas that the people who support me uh, hold and the ones who are ready to, willing to work and send me money, those ideas are critical to me and, and to the movement. And uh, the perception uh, that the people hold is critical. It will be a mixture, though, of something very, very superficial. My estimation about how people vote uh, for candidates is not so much that uh, they voted for me, not so much that I was a champion of the free enterprise system, but uh, somebody who uh, voted honestly and did my very best and that they could trust me. And I think that perception probably was uh, overbalanced, you know, all the negative approach of saying, well, you know, he isn't getting enough for us. Matter of fact, it sort of built uh, it almost confirmed the fact that they could trust me because I was even willing, you know, to take a stand that might be conventionally construed as non-political. So certainly ideas have, uh, have consequences. They're critical to the ultimate uh, destiny of the nation. And yet, uh, on a day-in, day-out political battle, uh, I think you have to take this uh, and, and weigh it. it. There's a relative weight to it. Uh, but the ultimate... Uh, uh, nature of the government in the country will depend on the ideas that groups like this develop and the ideas that you hold and the perceptions, of, especially of those who contribute and work in campaigns. But when it comes down to pulling a lever, it will be for uh, quite a different ways. And I think this is a way uh, that you can bring the conflict together that politics uh, never deal in real ideas versus the idea that everybody deals only in, in uh, that uh, people only deal in ideas, because I, I think it's a, a combination of both. In 76, I would say the perception of my views that I took uh, were looked at in a much more negative way than they are looked at now. Uh, the word libertarian is used quite frequently with the free market, and uh, uh, it's a different uh, meaning for some than for others. But in general, uh, they will associate my views with a libertarian view or a free market uh, view. In 76, I would say there were very, very few who even heard the word or understood it or even asked about it. And yet today, they will kiddingly come up to me and they say, well, what's the libertarian position on this? And uh, this uh, means that they're, they're becoming aware that there is something else, that there is another viewpoint besides the competing uh, forces in, uh, that are using government in a conservative way versus a liberal way. And they see that there is another stand. And uh, over time, I hope I can persist with uh, gaining respectability for it in that, uh, that they respect the view. They might not agree with it, but I find that uh, they're not ashamed of it because even though they might not be anxious to take those rare stands on the House floor that are dangerous politically but uh, correct philosophically, but if there happens to be a rating where there's only five or ten votes and they happen to do well uh, on it, uh, more or less accidentally, but my name is associated with it, it seems like they would like to use that. They would like to benefit say, and go back, march into their district where they may have been voting too liberal and go to their conservative friends and say, look, see, I have credentials now. I voted with somebody who knows and understands and believes uh, in the free market. So, so they do uh, want to cling to uh, uh, somebody or some things with, uh, that are, are related to uh, sound principles. Yesterday, we had a pretty typical example of, of the conflict of those who would like to deal in ideas, who would like to follow the general rhetoric of what's been happening in the last several months, versus the old problem of the uh, political uh, interpretation of what they should do with a vote. And this was the agriculture bill. And I think it's interesting if I just tell you a little bit about what happened, because it tells you about what's hap what happens generally in legislation. The, um, the vote came up, uh, we were ready for final passage. Uh, the committee uh, member, who's usually managing the bill, standing at the desk, and he was standing there, and he's usually the one responsible for getting a recorded vote. And the minority side uh, usually asks for it because we're usually on the losing side of a particular vote. And this was a large uh, appropriation, but as it came up, and everybody had hung around from the last amendment vote because they knew final passage would come up and there would be a recorded vote. And uh, all of a sudden, the speaker looked and paused for a minute and uh, the fellow sat down and it was passed. I mean, it was hardly by whisper. 
And this multi-billion dollar budget was passed. It was many billions of dollars over the, uh, I'm, I'm hold back, I don't know exactly how many dollars over, but it was over the president's request. And there's a question of whether the president might even veto the agriculture bill because it's higher than the budget resolution. And there was no recorded vote. And uh, the main reason was this. Uh, there are a lot of conservative Republicans in the Midwest who believe that they cannot ever vote against an agricultural bill and get reelected. Well, if I can vote against NASA and get reelected, they ought to consider it, you know. <laughs> but they, they said we couldn't do it, and they didn't want to, of course, if they voted uh, for it, uh, or, or uh, for it, uh, then they would say, well, there you go, you voted to break the budget. So, of course, it would be better not to have a vote. But um, then an unusual procedure after it was substituted with the Senate number, which was essentially just a parliamentary uh, maneuver, uh, then another member out of the farm district came and asked for a vote, and they got a recorded vote uh, at an unusual time. So we did go back and had a recorded vote. But there at that time, the conservative Republican, who has been the champion, the leader of your cause to cut spending, is moaning and groaning, you know, oh my God, now I have to vote uh, for this. So there, there is a lot of that that goes on. They're not, uh, you know, serious enough, nor do they have a comprehension of, of what uh, really needs to be done in the Congress, which means uh, that uh, we should, you know, cut the budget. Uh, the truth is, is we're not cutting the budget. The budget is very, very high. It's way above last year's budget. And with the uh, planned increases in the defense, uh, military, foreign aid budget, it's, uh, it's, it's, going, it's, it's out of control. Uh, I imagine most people here know the name Hans Senholtz. I was talking to Dr. Senholtz yesterday, and uh, I think the announced, and uh, Bruce probably knows these figures better than I do, the announced deficit for last year, I believe I saw, was at $55 billion, somewhere in that range. And yet he claims with his calculation of off-budget, I need to run this down and, and check him out, and make sure he's giving me the right figures. But he claims that there's one forty-one point five billion dollar of real debt increase, you know, for uh, last year's budget. When you take off all the off, off budget, so uh, there's still there's still a lot of deficits going uh, going on, and that means there's still going to be a bit of pressure on the uh, on the Federal Reserve. Now the one. Uh, the one area that I work in the most and was mentioned in the introduction that I'd like to talk about a little bit where, where I think ideas do have consequences and that uh, debate and talk has, uh, has developed into a popular movement, and that is on the money issue. Uh, I, in 74, I ran for the very first time, and it was out of frustration over what happened in 1971 in the uh, Republican administration with wage and price controls and the closing of the gold window. And uh, it was the money issue that I was most interested in. And uh, I was not elected that year, but came up here in, in 76. And uh, it was mostly laughs about what was going on with the, with the monetary system. Yet now there's a serious discussion going on. We have a gold commission that's been established. A lot of people will call up and say, you know, just tell me, uh, tell me just what, uh, what is the most optimistic thing you think can happen with the Gold Commission after you do all your report? You know you're not in the majority. You know they'll ask it in a very negative way. They'll say, well, the, most, uh, the, mo the, best, the, uh, the best benefit has already come. And that is it's a public discussion. It's in the Wall Street Journal and in Barron's and Time and, uh, uh, and Newsweek. You know, all the conventional magazines, uh, ABC, CBS, McNear, Lair, and, and everybody's talking about it now. Not because all of a sudden they have become uh, uh, philosophic and believe that uh, we ought to have a morally uh, and uh, constitutionally sound currency, but out of desperation because we have such a a lousy currency that is uh, depreciating so quickly and uh, that the bond market's being wiped out and they can't build houses. So out of necessity, they do have to look uh, for a new idea uh, or a different idea and different approach. And it just happens that uh, the Gold Commission was established and in place and the need came along. The commission certainly has been the vehicle uh, for the discussion. Uh, the need has blended in and there is a very, very serious discussion going on. We will have our third meeting for the Gold Commission uh, on, uh, on Monday. So this is an event that moved uh, uh, much quicker than I ever dreamed. I would have thought that uh, it would be several more years before a serious discussion would occur. And I'm even now lean toward more pessimism and say, you know, there's still no chance that anything's going to happen 
you know, it's going to be a long time. But there are others who believe that you should have a gold-backed currency uh, who are much more optimistic and think it could even occur within months. Now, I don't happen to, to believe that. Uh, but uh, I was surprised about the rapidity of the uh, changes that have occurred since 76. And um, I am hopeful for that. Uh, I do believe, though, that uh, the idea put out by Hayek, uh, or at least uh, popularized by Hayek, I can't believe he, he was the originator, that is of competing market currencies. And um, this is catching hold. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, the Chamber of Commerce is pretty soon going to be, I'm going to be champion the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, they wrote about it in the Wall Street Journal yesterday and talked about competing currencies. So, uh, and looking back in the, just another aside on who may be on our, on our friends, in the debates in 1968 when, uh, when we um, took off the 25% cover, uh, the uh, Small Bank Association, the, uh, uh, the, the small group of bankers, were strongly uh, disapproving the removal of the gold cover. The ABA was for it, but the smaller banks were for it, uh, for holding on to a gold currency. And I still run into a lot of bankers, and usually so often hard money people say, well, the bankers, you know, are inflationists. Well, some of the big bankers are, but there are a lot of bankers who believe in honesty and sound money. And uh, I think that... Uh, we, we, we're moving in the right direction and, and quickly because somebody did take the time to write down an idea and something that I can hang my hat on and to, and to use and uh, in some way or another popularize it or get voted for for other reasons. I might not be able to explain all those things well enough to all my constituents, but if I can convince them I'm going to do my very best to give them something that we would call an honest currency and they trust me, yes, then the ideas will have a consequence when I go to Washington and try to implement these ideas as long, uh, regardless of how uh, I get there. And this is some of the political mistakes made by some. Uh, they believe that if you're a purist in thought and you're going to go to Washington to be a purist, therefore you have to put everything out on the table exactly as it would be and everybody understands every iota of uh, anything you've ever said. Well, that uh, sounds good and your workers should understand everything you believe in, but in a campaign, that's not true. In a campaign, it's going to be votes coming for various reasons, very, very superficial uh, reasons. And uh, in politics, you take your votes how you get them. You don't, uh, don't uh, refuse a vote because somebody's voting for you because they misunderstood you. And you say, well, I, want, <laughs> I don't want your vote because I'm really not for that. You know, you, you just uh, live in the real world of politics. Uh, but when we get there, we have to do something. Which is most important? Uh, this is often a debate. Uh, is the idea world more important than the political world? And I had somebody come up to me the other day, and they tried to discourage me. They say, it's time you drifted away from the world of ideas and got more involved in the world of politics. Get your political action committee going and start, uh, you know, you raising money and getting certain members into the Congress, which is a, a reasonable suggestion uh, for somebody who de uh, does deal in politics. But he was de-emphasizing and said, the groundwork has been done. We've done the work and everybody knows what the free market ideas are and we don't need to concentrate so much in the educational aspect. Well, I don't think that's quite true. I think we still have a lot more work. But I don't say that education is the only thing and politics is nothing. I've had some very good libertarian friends who say, yes, educate yourself, take care of yourself, help your neighbor and educate your neighbor. But forget about the government. The government's the enemy. You can't change government. You can't even participate in government. But I don't buy that. Obviously, I wouldn't be here. I can do a little bit better staying in Texas. I don't have to come up here and run around if, if I didn't believe that uh, some form of government is necessary and good and that we can change it and feel very fortunate that we have a government and a system free enough where we can change it, where we can get involved, where we can go out and do something. And I think that's uh, so important. But the ideas, I think, are critical. And we have to work with them. We have to continue with it. It's... What's so wonderful about it is in a group like this, some might be more inclined to working uh, only with ideas and others only in politics, and you know, that's fine. Uh, but I think it takes both. I think the ideas have to be there, uh, and you have to have an ideological movement uh, before the politician can do anything. And uh, I think that 
uh, I'm, we're all, you know, in a transition, and I think I'm really in the middle, at the beginning, uh, at, in the middle of that transition, that I can even see it where, uh, you know, a, a hard line approach in 76 uh, was scoffed at much more so than now. But books like uh, Bob has coming out, they're going to make great assistance. That's the kind of stuff that needs to be done. Somebody needs to put one of those in the hands of every legislative assistant in Congress. You know, that would be a good project so they can refer to that. It should be a reference book when they're dealing with OSHA, you know, to come up and have something they can look at. They can look at an alternative. So that's critical. It's critical in, uh, in making uh, the ideas uh, work uh, in the legislative sense. The two can't be separated as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I am happy to try to deal with uh, both, and it's for this reason that I have uh, pursued uh, putting out a freedom report where I, uh, I consider it quite modest, but something that uh, is attractive to a lot of people uh, who might not have read it otherwise. You know, they uh, aren't interested in reading economic textbooks, but uh, they might receive a short, uh, easily read uh, piece uh, or an article uh, sent to, to them from me. And I have a large number of people on that list. And uh, I'm always trying to expand those numbers. And I can get a lot of people to read that that wouldn't have read otherwise. So this is the spreading of the ideas. But uh, I couldn't come to Washington. I mean, it's hard enough as it is, uh, I think, being at the early stages of a libertarian uh, revolution. But uh, there is nothing if I'm standing by myself, but because of the groups, you know, the groups in Wisconsin and Newark and uh, Alaska and Texas, all through the country that are growing now, uh, this will make the difference. The only real question I have, and I believe Hayek states this question too, or, or, or doubt, and is how much time does it take to make sure that the people will endorse those ideas and understand why we can abolish OSHA and EPA and come up with something else without destroying the country. Will there be enough people to understand that, you know, if you did go to a sound currency, possibly there's a little bit more adjustment period than some of us would like. Maybe there will be a bit of malinvestment and debt to be liquidated. And uh, will they be patient enough to wait six months or 10 months or a year and keep your hands off? That's a big question. And right now, today, I would say no. They have no patience at all. And that we stand on the verge of attempting to impose our ideas and yet uh, at the same time we uh, stand on the, on the brink of a, of a holocaust economically and socially. Because if the money doesn't work and the welfare checks won't buy anything, uh, the people who have been conditioned that they have a right to your wallet and they don't receive the purchasing power stolen from your efforts, yes, they're going to revolt and then there's going to be chaos, and our attempt to change things will go down the drain. That's why I think it's so important that in dealing with the ideas that we may have the ideal that we would like, ideally there should be no post office, and there should be private delivery of mail. But that doesn't mean that uh, I should draw up a law today and abolish the post office at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, and that would be it, even though I think that probably would work pretty well. I think it would by the day after, I think it would be delivering mail again. But as a suggestion that the people might accept a little easier, is just legalize the right for you to deliver your first class mail. And uh, the transition would come. And that's why I, I think the idea of competing in cur currencies is so good. It's something that uh, is achievable. I'm optimistic enough to think that uh, we may get that, a major part of that into the uh, majority report. They would never accept the idea that tomorrow we will quit monetizing debt and we will have a gold currency. That's not going to happen. But they see the, the true anti-gold pro-paper person uh, is less threatened by gold and say, yeah, if you kooky people want to hold gold coins, go ahead. And we'll mint coins and let you have them. Uh, I think it would be much difficult, more difficult to get rid of the legal tender laws and get rid of the taxation on the buying and the selling of the gold. But uh, we're making inroads into this idea that uh, we ought to have it stand on its merits, uh, the paper money versus the gold money. So I am very, very hopeful. I think psychologically, if nothing else, even if we didn't start using the gold immediately, psychologically, if... Uh, 
if the Gold Commission came out uh, at March 31st and said the Treasury will now uh, mint uh, one-tenth, one-half, one-quarter an ounce gold, ounce gold coins and to be sold to the American people, and the liberals say, oh, that's great, we're going to mess up the South Africans, you know, and they'll say, yeah, that's good, we'll sell them and let people buy them and, and let them mint them as often as possible. You know, I've always worried about, uh, a lot of people are, aren't uh, too convinced we have the gold at Fort Knox, and I don't even know if we do. But, uh, and they won't audit it, so I think, well, let's sell it. That'll be the best audit ever. We'll find out if it's there. Let the gold, and I used to believe more strongly that the gold had to be in the hand of the government because it had to be a government 100% gold coin standard, and we couldn't do it on our own. But uh, I'm more convinced every day that the safest thing we can do is secure our liberties, allow the marketplace to work, and get the hands in the hands of the people, get the gold in the hands of the people. It would work. I mean, we wouldn't have to worry about it. Matter of fact, even it would be a tragedy if the gold didn't exist in uh, Fort Knox. But even without it, I think that uh, with freedom and with the incentives that uh, come along with a free market, uh, the market could handle it. The gold would come to the country. We would become productive and uh, prices would adjust. So um, it's a matter of convincing the people that they don't have anything to fear about freedom. Uh, I think that it takes a lot of understanding about the transition so that we can teach them to keep their hands off. Very often I compare this to what happens when the, uh, and this doesn't happen quite so much as it did a few years ago, but uh, uh, when penicillin first came out, the physician was inundated with people coming in because penicillin was given so carelessly. The patient would come in, would have a viral cold, and I want a shot of pen and doc, you know. And so, well, you know, the, the patient's pressuring the doctor, the doctor's harassed, and the doctor's going to make an extra 10 bucks, so he gives him a shot of penicillin. It doesn't do anything with the cold, and it complicates things. It makes his condition worse because penicillin is dangerous to those people who are allergic. It makes bacteria uh, uh, so that they're not susceptible to the penicillin. So it has all kinds of potential complications if you give antibiotics carelessly. That's the way it is in the economy. You know, if you, keep, if you keep your hands off, things will solve the problems are, a, as well. And it takes a good doctor who can say, but you need to go home and take a rest and just let things be, you know, and we don't need to be uh, interfering with you. But today, I'm afraid, uh, really what we face is the crisis soon if the unemployment rates jumps to uh, 10, 11, 12 percent. Is the Federal Reserve going to say tight, you know, and uh, are they going to turn the money supply loose? And uh, what will happen to the unemployment benefits? What will happen to all those programs? Uh, our side is still too weak. And that's why the efforts that have to be made in the educational field, I think, can't be underemphasized. I don't feel secure that we have done all the work necessary educationally. And we have to popularize them. Even though it is true that a movement only needs 3 or 4% of the people totally dedicated and understanding it, you still have to have a consensus of the people not to fear what you're doing and be convinced that you're right, and you have to be leading the way uh, in, in a conventional sense with the media and the government and people getting up and standing up and leading so that people do not panic. And uh, that's what we need. We need time. I believe if uh, we had a monetary and economic catastrophe tomorrow, the next day, or the next year, uh, the net uh, result would be negative. I think that we would lose more freedoms. Um, but I believe that if we had some more time, the chances would be much better that uh, the groundwork will be done and that we can impose change if we can get the people to understand that a price probably will have to be paid. I haven't bought the argument that there will be no price to pay for the unwise spending of the 50 years and the unwise uh, inflation. If it were so easy to go from where we are and say that we can wave a magic wand and don't worry about deficits, deficits don't matter and all this, and say that we can go to a gold standard and interest rates are going to come down and everything's going to be all right, do you know that's the best argument I've ever heard for 50 years of inflation? Man, I'd do that. I'd go for 50 years of inflation if we can switch our, our, our direction and there's no penalty pay. Now, that's the tough part. Uh, who's going to bring it on and say, yes, this is it and we must do it? But I'm optimistic to think that uh, we're in better shape than we were. Uh, the movement uh, certainly is growing for those who believe in individual liberty and that uh, it has to be kept going. But uh, I believe it's, that we're at a critical stage, and I believe in the next few years you're going to see the results. Uh, let's just hope and pray that we don't have an international or a national catastrophe that sets us back. 
So uh, to me, uh, it's most important uh, that groups like the Council for Competitive Economy are encouraged and, uh, and continue to be supported. They need to help. Uh, they are effective. Congressmen, by the way, Rich, are very, very much aware of ratings. Uh, you get some respectability, and they hear about this, and they don't like to be rated low. You know, that's bad. So keep it up. Do two or three a year or something. Keep after them. Tell them they rate lousy and send it to their district or something. You know, <laughs> but uh, they don't like to be rated and uh, if, they, if they're rated poorly. So I think all these things are, are great and you should be encouraged and, uh, and thanked because uh, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, groups like this and National Taxpayers Union and, and others are very, very much of a help to me. And uh, someday soon we're going to get several more dozen over here that believe the same way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Paul. Our policy, uh, whenever possible, is to not let people go away without having the chance to ask a few questions. So if you don't mind, we'll take a few if you've got them. Questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, votes in the ballot box uh, are essential to public opinion and changing public policy and for electing people the likes of Ron Paul and uh, others who respect uh, what the Council for Competitive Economy stands for, limited government, individual freedom, free market economy, and economic growth with the investment of private capital resources and the parents to accumulate. Uh, and we have language barriers because of the influx of uh, many foreign elements into our country that don't know what the legitimate functions of government or free society really are. And uh, we must depend on those people that have platforms, the likes of you, to tell them this, or to come to an audience of people, uh, this kind of association, so that we can filter down to the mentality of absorption for the electorate with one man, one vote, because that's what puts you in office and keeps you there. And you, once you get off the way from the practice of medicine, your life's work. <laughs> and get into another vocational activity of a forgotten country, and in order to sleep on a pillow step with the veterans of a clear conscience, not necessarily as a politician, but a statesman, you don't want to evade the truth. You want to speak it, which makes a difference between the politician and the statesman, who'd rather die for cause than to sell his soul to the country store and uh, because he couldn't live with it. And I think that uh, this country has been based on high principles. And I don't see why the likes of you at any time or anyone of your kind would have to do that. Now, what are your potentials and what is your thinking on this kind of political action to preserve a competitive economy? Because freedom follows a free market like night to day. And when the economy is free, we can attain those nice things. Okay. And you're thinking along the terms of what am I going to do outside the legislative realm, and what can I? Recommendations which you have to change, uh, not here in Washington, because you're on a merry-go-round here all the time, and I hear there's a lot of confusion. But let me tell you, the thing that puts you in office is back in your hometown, all right. in your own area. Well, I don't know if I understand the question completely, but I think that that is p part of the p part of the responsibility and the obligation I have is to continue to communicate with these people and anybody and everybody else that I can for them to understand, uh, you know, what what the uh, issue is all about and what the philosophy is all about. Uh, but I think this is done differently by everybody. Do you have a translation in Spanish now? You have many Spanish. No, I don't. Well, well, there are some Spanish-speaking people, but uh, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> I have enough trouble understanding this all in English, you know. <laughs> yeah. What is the mechanism for going to a gold standard? In other words, if Reagan woke up tomorrow morning and 
was convinced that this was the only thing to do. Uh, what, what is the procedure? There are different procedures. I have one that is proposed in the form of legislation, and uh, it would uh, essentially uh, say that uh, there would be no more monetization of debt. Uh, the government would live within their means, and the Federal Reserve note would be redeemed at a market value of gold set in one year. And the government would get out of the business of uh, monetizing debt completely and totally, and their budget would be balanced. And, but there are various other forms, and this is a difficult question. I, uh, I don't know the, the, uh, the very best because, um, a matter of fact, today I was talking with Murray Rothbard uh, on this very subject, and he has some questions in his mind too, and I respect him as being one of the brightest free market economists. And his proposal is that, um, that you set a price of gold very, very high uh, so that uh, you don't have to worry about you know, deflation. A few times in the past they've set the price low, like in England in the 20s, and it didn't last. So he suggested it, that it be set high by the government rather than the market. And uh, I think uh, all these different considerations uh, have to be considered, but uh, that should be what we're really debating, you know, in the Gold Commission uh, rather than uh, uh, monetarism is what we've drifted into. Espouse free enterprise, and I'll put the word free in quote, are also those who seek subsidies, protection, uh, tariffs, uh, what have you. Uh, wouldn't competitive enterprise really be a better term to use? Well, I'd be, I'd be uh, very favorable to that term. Uh, matter of fact, it's rarely uh, that I use the word free enterprise or laissez-faire. Uh, laissez-faire uh, connotes a lot of negativism, and free enterprise sort of is a word that people get turned off with. Competitive enterprise tells you a little bit more. I usually use, a, you know, the, uh, the word the market economy, the free market. Uh, but um, I think a competitive economy is exactly what we're looking for. I've been an activist in politics since maybe 76. And the biggest kitchen coffee table debate is where is the constituency? Uh, and... This has been a constant subject of discussion my my most my my friends in the last five years. In your opinion, looking at the diversity of this group as, as an example, if you were going out to find the market for these ideas, okay, where do you think the most important places are to, to sell the ideas at? What's the most fertile ground? Are you talking about uh, in a political sense or in an in educational a sense? sense? In a polit in political sense, uh, there's no answer. Because the number one reason why I think I'm in Congress is that the majority of the people of the district trusted me. So your constituency is every place. And that I cared about a working man as much as I cared about a businessman's profit. My rating went down in the NASA area, which was real Republican. I still got 62%. That's pretty good. I could have gotten maybe 70 if I'd played played all their games. But the labor district, my vote went up, not because I was a champion of labor unions, but because they trusted me and they thought I cared about what was happening to their pocketbook with the inflation. You know, they didn't understand about, about it. So the constituency is every place. So I would never narrow it down and narrow somebody's targets down. Uh, it's to be broad-based and, and go after everybody. And depends, of course, whether you're being you're approaching it as a Democrat versus a Republican versus Libertarian, you know it just depends so much on on the political approach in the group. But uh, you don't you don't decide well. There's a free market people that we reject the bankers. You know there's a lot of a lot of people in the banking business that believe in sound money. You know and that you don't reject it. And I think that's what I do sometimes. I get careless and sometimes I get to the point where I figure well most businessmen. Uh, aren't free market. Well, that's wrong. Most businessmen are good free market people and all they want is a chance because the small businessmen, the ones that give the bad uh, reputation are the international people who are in trade and want tariffs and are, can bid up the contracts, but that's a small number of people. I mean, there are three big companies that needed the port dug deep and the consent, political consensus of everybody was that was the key to all the votes in my hometown.
And yet my vote went up in that district, and I, I didn't raise a finger to do anything to get more federal money into the district. So uh, I, I think there's a misperception. I think that the constituency is every place, and you should address that. But you have to recognize that that eventual vote isn't going to come because, uh, because I had this uh, uh, very definite uh, viewpoint on liberty. The last 30 years there's been, in my view, an unfortunate association of uh, free enterprise philosophy with uh, militarism and foreign interventionism. Do you see this changing at all? The uh, changing away from the association of, a, of, a, of, a, of the so-called free market and militarism? Uh, no, I would say it's probably uh, being enhanced uh, in the last uh, year or so. <laughs> Um, that, again, I think is uh, information needs to be out. We don't have any one major group. Uh, we have a group maybe talking about a competitive economy and somebody talking about gold and somebody talking about taxes, but how many groups, uh, uh, non-tax uh, foundations who are dedicated to uh, uh, working for a non-interventionist uh, foreign policy? I, would, uh, I don't know of, uh, of any uh, educational group that way, but uh, I know one thing that if you want to talk about uh, a, a good subject with average conservative Republicans, I can get them applauding every time about, do you think it's time we ought to quit paying for the defense of Japan when they take the money and give it to their car companies? You know, they're sick of it. They say, oh, is that right? And I said, yeah, you want me to spend, you want to know why I don't spend, vote for all those military budgets? Then they understand it. They never get it offered. So I would say there's a, there is a source or there is a, some, a vacuum that could be filled by a group that would promote that because I think the American people are basically ready more so than ever. Yes, after the war, Europe was torn up. We were wealthy. Give them a couple bucks, you know, just because we're eventually going to destroy the dollar. They can't see all that. But... <laughs> Now the dollar's destroyed, near broke, they can't buy a house, they can't buy a car, and you know, they want something done. So they're, they're ready for that. And uh, when you tell them that, you know, you're spending more money and you're getting less defense, you're not even getting any defense. Chrysler's getting a contract for tanks that don't work, you know, and uh, it's getting worse. And do you feel any more secure because you have tanks that don't work that you're going to send to Europe? Do you feel more secure because we're building bombs that the Germans won't let us put over there where they're supposed to be? You know, it's, it's just a ridiculous struggle. Do you feel more secure because we're going to send $3 billion worth of weapons to Pakistan so they can fight India? Why don't you want to give AWACSs to Saudi Arabia? Well, because I don't want the F-15s that we gave to Israel to shoot them down. You know? <laughs> it goes on and on. <laughs> so. Dr. Paul, one theme that I detected in your comment about your success in the last election, the fact that people trust you. I know that you've used the ethical perspective for the, on the free market, arguing that it's not just efficient, but it's morally correct. And we here at the Council for a Competitive Economy have stressed that in our work in Congress, because we know that when businessmen go to a congressman and say, well, we go along to get along and vote for us and we'll pay you off. How do you see your success as it relates to the use of the ethical argument by congressmen to argue that the free market is right, regardless of whether it helps my district? Do you think congressmen can be persuaded to go that direction? Not very often, <laughs> unfortunately. I don't think that means you should not keep pursuing it, and uh, maybe they will uh, accept that as a legitimate argument. But I've made the statement, I hope someday this is going to be an incorrect statement, but the weakest argument in a committee hearing is to use a moral or a constitutional argument. I mean, that, that doesn't carry much weight. Uh, pragmatism is the only thing. What's it going to do? Uh, you know, they'll have things like a housing bill coming up, and there's an amendment proposed. Well, the person proposing the amendment will then have a sheet of paper just like that that goes out and they'll have it broken down by the computer, what it means to Texas, what it means to Houston, what it means to District 22, what it means. That's, you know, that's the thing that carries the weight, uh, is that pragmatic argument under that circumstance. 
Now, if, uh, if they want to vote a certain way and they know you have a moral argument, they'll love it and they'll use it, but they'll be hypo hypocritical about it. Uh, there are some of the worst anti-constitutional congressmen over there who love to recite to Congress because they happen to be right, say, on the draft. And they will, you know, champion that. And I think that's that association that sometimes they desire to have with me when I happen to be in their corner. But they don't really care about an overall concept of the Constitution and really uh, defend the Constitution down the line. But when it's beneficial to them, they'll recite the Constitution or a moral argument. But I think it should be continued to be used, and I think as there's a transition up here, uh, and we'll get new people, and uh, they'll be more reasonable. <laughs> I'm afraid our time has run out. And thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much, Congressman Paul. Your comments about uh, the penicillin case, and uh, Bob's talking about the solving Economic problems through the marketplace remind me that uh, my philosophy in the economy, uh, political economy, and through the council is the same as my father, who has been a physician for 45 years. And I asked him one time what his secret was, and he said that very early in his career, he learned that most people would get better if he didn't do something to kill them. And I think that's uh, <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. We've had a very successful conference. Thank you.